last two years. And for user space, more or less, for what you can do. Yeah, I've seen in your description. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I, I don't know details of uh, any of them. I only know the dealing with virtualization and probably all. It's the user space part of PDM. Yeah. Yeah. You can have a kernel part and a user space part. Yeah. Why they are uh, called KVM? <laughs> ah, yeah, it's a little bit historical, you know. <laughs> and the projects are different, so there are different set of people working on the part. Yeah, but it still uh, works together as a one, does, yeah. one tool. You probably don't use one without the other. Can we start? Yes. Perfect. Go ahead. Thank you. And do you hear me well? Yeah? So today I'll talk about uh, real-time KVM. My name is Luis. I work um, at Red Hat as a senior software engineer. And uh, here is what I'm going to cover today. First, I'll give you an introduction to real-time. Then I'll present uh, real-time KVM itself. I'll show you some testing results we have done. And I'm going to talk about um, how to avoid latency spikes and work that it is, is still in progress. Um, so what's real time? Real time is a little bit of a difficult topic sometimes. Um, the most important thing that we, you have to understand about real time is that uh, on a real time system, what really matters is the maximum time that an operation takes. And this maximum time is non upfront and it's guaranteed to be the same even if the system is under very high load. So for example, a uh, thread wake up. Suppose you have a thread waiting for something. Uh, for example, um, a packet to arrive, uh, an alarm to trigger, to, to fire. And then the packet arrives, or the alarm triggers, and your thread wakes up. Uh, as it turns out, there are many things that can happen between the thread being ready to run and the thread actually executing on a CPU. On a real-time system, the time it takes for a thread to wake up is non upfront. So I could tell you, well, in this real time system, it takes five microseconds for a thread to wake up. And even if the system is under very high load, it's going to be five microseconds. On a non real time system, you really don't know how long it can take. It could take milliseconds. You don't know, it's unbounded. And where you are going to use this kind of system? Um, it's usually used for workloads where missing deadlines are bad. An example of this are uh, telecommunication networks. So, uh, you know, the networks that we uh, use when we use our cell phones uh, so that your voice doesn't break up. Um, vehicle control and avionic systems uh, usually have to be real time. And stock trading systems also uh, are usually real time. And how do you do real time on Linux? Uh, as it turns out, you need a patch. You need to patch the Linux kernel. And the patch is called a preempt RT patch, uh, which means uh, real time preemption. Uh, we also call it a real time patch, RT patch, but it all uh, refers to the same thing. Uh, so you have to patch the kernel and then. You apply this patch, and the kernel becomes uh, a real-time kernel. Uh, this patch exists for many years. It's, it's not new at all. And many features that the people behind this patch have developed to support real-time are already, uh, already merged in the mainline kernel. So some of the features are um, having RQ handlers as threads, uh, high-resolution timers, 
uh, PI in mutexas, priority inheritance, mutexas that support uh, priority inheritance, uh, making RCU read critical sections uh, preemptible, and having a deterministic real time scheduler. So those features, they are very complex, uh, each of them. And they either originated in the RT patch or they were uh, motivated by it. Now, there is one feature which is not on the mainline kernel yet. And as it turns out, is we can say that it's, it's the core feature that actually makes the kernel real time. So this is. Uh, it's not actually a feature. The feature itself is a PI mutexas, but on the real-time kernel, you convert spin locks into sleeping spin locks. In the real-time kernel, the spin locks don't spin. They sleep. And they support something called, uh, oh, sorry, priority inheritance. Uh, so this uh, priority inheritance, th inheritance thing is to... Uh, avoid uh, having a high priority thread waiting for a lower priority, priority thread. This is a problem that has to be solved for real time. And, and then another thing I'd like to tell about this patch is that it's, it's not a simple patch. We call it a patch, but it's actually a pet set with uh, more than 200 patches. And the, the, the core thing there is this uh, spin lock conversion. <laughs> But there are other uh, fixes that are specific for real time and are not uh, merged yet. So the important thing to understand here is you need this patch, and spin locks are different in the uh, real time kernel. So we have the real time kernel. Why do we have to make KVM real time? Why do we have to make? Um, KVM deterministic. The short answer for this question is that by doing this, uh, it allows you to have uh, real-time workloads in, in your cloud, for example. Right? You, make, um, you, you get all virtualization features with, um, for your workload. But there is a more, um, more important reason for this, and it's the telecommunication industry. As it turns out, the, the telecommunications industry is about to, to go through a revolution. And the revolution is called uh, network function virtualization. The telecommunication industry networks, the ones that are built so that we can use our uh, cell phones, they are built with proprietary hardware, proprietary hardware and proprietary software. So this has uh, cost issues. It has scaling issues. and the telco guys, they want to virtualize all the uh, telecommunication networks, and they want, want to use commodity hardware, open source, uh, KVM, and OpenStack. So they are you know, the most important driver for this feature. And OK, so what's real-time KVM? When we talk about real-time KVM, what am I talking about? I will tell you what real-time KVM is not first. So it, it is not a new kernel module or um, a module option that when set or, or loaded, your VMs become real-time. It, it is not that. There were many kernel changes that were needed, but they are all upstream. And just a few of them are KVM specific. Most of them are fixes to get the kernel out, out of the way of uh, KVM. Um, so those changes are upstream already. Um, so as long as you get a real, the real-time kernel, when I say real-time kernel, I'm talking about the Linux kernel with the RT patch applied. When you get the real-time kernel uh, in the guest and in the host, real-time KVM is really about two things. First, a BIOS configuration that is required. And secondly, it's a very specific host and guest configuration that you have to do. Let's take a look at the BIOS configuration. Uh, as far as the hardware goes, we have used a, a pretty standard uh, x86 boxes so far. The only detail is the BIOS configuration. Uh, so the BIOS has something. 
called uh, SMIs, or um, System Management Interrupts. Uh, those are special interrupts, and they are triggered by the motherboard. When they trigger, the kernel stops uh, executing, the kernel is, is, is uh, halted, and the BIOS runs. When this happens, you're not real-time anymore because the BIOS runs a mode called uh, system management mode, and it, it can take, take milliseconds. You don't know how long it's going to take, so you, you, you lose the ter determinism that I, I talked earlier. So you have to disable this. And, but the problem in disabling this is that uh, there is no uh, SMI option in the BIOS. As it turns out, any BIOS option that requires the system management mode uh, is going to activate uh, SMIs automatically. So how do you know which BIOS options you have to disable in order to uh, disable SMIs? Uh, some hardware vendors, they have a document. It's called uh, System uh, Low Latency Settings for, uh, and then System Name. This document usually has a list of options that you have to disable. You disable those options, you are done. Uh, your system <coughs> won't have SMIs. If your vendor doesn't provide this document, then you have to find the option for yourself, and it's not easy. It's very difficult. Uh, the preemptor T kernel, it provides a, a kernel module, and there is a Python script to do the user space part called hardware lat latency detector. So this module is, tries to, to, to find if SMIs are enabled. Um, if they are, then let people get in. If they are, then you are not done yet. You, you have to keep disabling options. Um, now, the bad news is that some systems are not fixable. They have hardwired SMIs. Those systems are not for real time. You cannot use them for real time. So once you, you, you do the BIOS change, the next part is to start the host configuration, the host setup. Um, so the first thing is the host requires the real time kernel, as I have already mentioned. And then you have to do something called host partition. Partitioning is uh, the process of uh, creating two groups of cores, okay, of host cores. The first group, it's called real-time cores, and the second group, it's called housekeeping cores. Uh, the difference between those two groups is that the real-time cores group, they are aggressively isolated. Being aggressively isolated means that they are going to run only two things. First, a, th a single thread and a few CPU-bound kernel threads. <coughs> the housekeeping cores, they run everything else. They run uh, user-level processes, kernel threads, uh, hierarchy handlers, everything else. So now I'm talking about the concepts, okay, because they are a little <coughs> bit difficult. And after I show you the concepts, I'm going to show you how to do this configuration. So let's see some diagrams. Suppose you have a host. This is a host. And it has two sockets, two NUMA nodes. Each NUMA node has four cores. So to do the partitioning here, what we could do is we are going to take uh, all the NUMA node zero cores and make them housekeeping cores. And then the NUMA node 1 cores, uh, they are going to be our real-time cores. So we apply the configuration that I'm going to show you uh, shortly. And then you are going to have this. Uh, housekeeping cores, as I said, and real-time cores. As it turns out, the guest requires the same configuration as the host. So it requires the real-time kernel, as I keep repeating this. And you have to create two groups of vCPU, vCPUs. So you are going to have uh, real-time vCPUs and housekeeping, housekeeping vCPUs. In addition to this, in the host, you have to pin each real-time vCPU to a real-time core and each housekeeping vCPU to a housekeeping core. Also, um, the... VCPU threads, all of them need real-time priority. 
and we also reserve huge pages for the real-time uh, vCPUs. And then your guest runs in the guest, of course, and the real-time threads are pinned to real-time vCPUs. Let's go back to diagrams to make it easier to, to see this. So suppose I have a, a guest, okay? And this guest has six vCPUs. This guest shown here is already uh, partitioned. So I have two uh, housekeeping vCPUs and four real-time vCPUs. Let, let's do the pinning. After you do the pinning, you can see here that the housekeeping vCPUs, are, each of them are pinned to a different housekeeping core, and each real-time vCPU is pinned to a different real-time core. And then your real-time application, again, runs in the guest, and the real-time threads, they are going to be pinned to real-time vCPUs. Um, real-time KVM is basically that. No, you, you, you cannot do that because I'm going to talk about that now, actually. So, as I said, the, the real-time GCPUs, they are aggressively isolated. That, that's the, the difference between the two. So, if you have uh, a thread that is doing something that's not supposed to do on the real-time GCPU, you're going to get uh, spikes. So, you have to move them to housekeeping cards. I don't know if that was your question, but maybe we can... Oh, no. Okay, no, because uh, if you have a thread migration, a task migration between uh, real-time GCPUs, then this uh, generates a spike. I, I have a list of things that generate spikes, so it has to be pinned. It's, it's mandatory. So, sorry. Um, so, as I said, the real-time uh, cores or VCPUs, they are aggressively isolated. How do you do this? It's, it's not very simple. So there are many things that you have to do. The first of them is you have to boot. Uh, it's written host here, but it's actually the guest and or the host uh, with ISO CPUs and no hertz full. These are kernel features. So ISO CPUs, it is, it, you pass a list of CPUs, and it, um, it won't schedule user-level processes to the CPUs uh, listed there, okay? Only kernel threads are going to run on CPUs that are listed in ISO CPUs. The other feature is, call, is called no hertz full. This feature also gets a CPU list, and what it does is, if it possible, if some conditions are met, it disables uh, the tick, the kernel tick. So the kernel has something called the tick that it, um, it's a timer that fires 1,000 times a second, and it's used to do bookkeeping. And it's an opportunity for the kernel to, for example, decide that a process has uh, uh, ran for too long, and now another process has to run there on, on the CPU. But it, the, it, it causes a 1,000 interrupts per second. So if you get only one thread running on a, on a core on a, on a, or a, on a vCPU, you don't need this interruption, and it's bad for real time. So with this feature, the kernel disables it. And then another thing you have to do to uh, completely isolate a uh, core or vCPU is to move all kernel threads uh, out of the core or the vCPU. Uh, so some, the kernel has a CPU-bound kernel threads. Those cannot be moved. But those, usually, they serve the thread that's running there. So if your thread don't, uh, don't require, doesn't require any service from those threads, uh, they are not going to run. Uh, you also have to move all uh, interrupt handlers threads out of cores or vCPUs. And then you have to do something that um, I'm calling run on all cores timers, because some kernel subsystems, they create one timer per core 
And those timers, they, they do appalling. So they run at uh, every few seconds or every few minutes. And uh, they can interrupt your real-time application. And if you set up the system in a way that it doesn't interrupt your real-time application, it's going to starve. So you don't want any of these things to happen. So you have to disable this kind of, of timer. The problem is uh, uh, different subsystems have different ways to do this. So the MEC driver has a kernel option for it. The slab allocator does this too. And the solution here is to use slab, for example. Uh, KVM clock uh, does this too, but we have uh, added a new option so that it doesn't do <laughs> You know, I sorry to, to, to say that, but I, if you could uh, wait for the end of the talk, because I'm afraid about the time. You know, I'd like to, to answer questions and make this a discussion, but I'm just uh, afraid about the time. Sorry about that. OK, so as you can see, doing the partitioning, doing this aggressively, ag aggressive uh, isolation thing are not simple. They, they are not trivial, right? Uh, the good news is we have automated all this stuff. So the, the automation here has three components. The first component is called uh, TuneD. TuneD is a tool that implements the concept of uh, a tuning profile. A tuning profile is a file where you list tuning steps. So things like writing to CSFS, writing to PROC, um, assigning real-time priority to threads, and things like that. When you activate the profile, the tuning steps are, are going to be all executed, and they will be uh, uh, you know, on the system. Um, we have created two profiles, one for the host and one for the guest. What you have to do is you install uh, Tune, you, you install our profiles, uh, and then you pass on the host and on the guest, you pass a list of cores or vCPUs to be uh, real time. And Tune is going to do the rest for you. It's going to do everything I have described so far. Mostly, actually, sorry. Uh, so there are some details that it doesn't do, but for example, uh, Libver, Libver does, uh, it's the other uh, tool that you, you need to, to get this stuff automated. And Libver does CPU pinning, and it assigns real-time priority to vCPU threads. And then there is OpenStack. Uh, it's, it's not, OpenStack is not finished yet. I'm going to talk a little bit about this later, but um, when it, support for it is red, it, it is going to provision and manage real-time guests automatically for, for a host. Now, let me show you some testing results. Um, so two, two important details about testing. We have used a tool that is very uh, popular among real-time people, which is called Cyclic Test. So this tool, this tool measures uh, thread wake up that I have described in the beginning of the talk. And the results shown here are uh, against RHEL kernel, just because it's where I work and it's where I do a lot of measuring. But all the changes that we, we, we had to do for the kernel, they are all upstream. So I do expect that you are going to get the same results on an on on upstream kernel. So we have created three uh, test cases. The first one is called single VM. In this test case, we create one VM with two vCPUs, one for real time and one for housekeeping. The host is fully set up, it's fully partitioned, as I, as I said earlier. For this test case, we run a cyclic test with one measuring thread. And for 24 hours, the maximum result that, that we actually get is uh, 11 microseconds. So I forgot to say something. Uh, cyclic test, it uh, outputs three values for you. Uh, minimum, average, and maximum. Uh, but for real time, we care about the maximum, right? It doesn't matter much if your minimum is good. You care about maximum. That's that what real time is about. So. For the single VM test case, we get 11 microseconds. This means that in the 
real-time KVM, a thread, in the very worst uh, case, is going to take 11 microseconds to wake up. When we started this work, uh, it was, uh, if, you, if you were running the real-time kernel without all this configuration, without the fixes we did, it was uh, 80, 90 microseconds. And if you are not running a real-time kernel, it's milliseconds. Uh, so the other test case is called multiple vCPUs test case. In this test case, we create a VM with eight vCPUs, two uh, for housekeeping and six for real time. In this test case, we have uh, six uh, measuring threads running, waking up, and, and being measured at the same time in the VM. In this test case, uh, we have, uh, and then you get uh, results for all your measuring threads. So we have six of them, and the best result is 14 microseconds. The worst is uh, 19 microseconds. Finally, we have a multiple VMs test case where we create uh, four VMs, each of them with two vCPUs, one for real time, one for housekeeping. So in this test case, we have four VMs uh, running cycle tests on the, in them, and they all do 12 microseconds. Uh, now, to get these uh, good results, there are some rules that the gas actually has to follow. So there, there are some limitations here. So the most important of them is that the real-time VCPUs, not the housekeeping VCPUs, the real-time VCPUs are not allowed to exit to user space. Uh, so uh, VCPU thread, it, it usually exits to user space to do I.O., this means that the real-time VCPU, it can only do one form of I.O., and that is network I.O. with uh, a virtual NIC and vHost or uh, device assignment. <coughs> Otherwise, the real-time VCPU cannot do any other form of I.O. So a question that people usually ask is, okay, how do I do block I.O.? Well, you can use the housekeeping VCPUs. You can pin a thread to the housekeeping CPU to do the AO, uh, the block AO. The housekeeping VCPU, it can exit user space. But your real-time application cannot wait for it to complete because you are adding uh, non-deterministic behavior. It has to queue and then you know, forget about it. Um, another detail is, so far, we have used very minimal guests. So uh, for bare metal, it is known that some hardwares, they uh, generate spikes, latency spikes. Uh, so we, we have decided to, we don't know if this is possible, if this is gonna happen with gas, but we decided to create uh, very small gas. So our gas so far, they don't have USB, they don't have sound card, they don't have graphic display, they don't have uh, additional uh, PCI slots, they, they are very small in terms of hardware. Um, also, there are some operations that if performance, if performance um, in the host or in the guests, uh, they are going to generate uh, a spike. They cause latent spikes. So, for example, CPU hot plug. You cannot do CPU hot plug or unplug in, in the host nor in the guest. Uh, the loading of uh, kernel modules or unloading uh, also used to generate spikes, but I think this is getting fixed or is already fixed. Uh, as a guess, it was your question, I guess. Uh, you cannot have uh, task migration between uh, isolated vCPUs or isolated cores because this uh, generates a spike. So threads have to be pinned. Page faults or swapping are really disallowed in real time because they generate spikes. And the host has to use uh, a stable TSC. This is required. Now, uh, this is my last slide. So, uh, work that is still in progress. There is a new feature in Intel CPUs called uh, cache allocation technology. This, features, this feature allows you to reserve a portion of the L3 cache to, uh, to threads. As it turns out, we need this for real-time KVM because with this feature, we can have real-time VCPUs and real-time 
real-time vCPUs and real uh, real-time vCPUs and housekeeping vCPUs sharing the same uh, sockets. Be otherwise, if you if you don't have this this feature, then uh, an application running on a um, housekeeping core could trash the L3 uh, the L3 cache, and this will generate a spike. So this allows you to reserve a portion of the L3 cache to the uh, real-time uh, vCPU and in the end to the real-time thread. Uh, patches have been posted for this uh, feature, but they are still in discussion for, for the kernel. This is a, a kernel feature. Uh, the other thing that we are doing is we are measuring network IO lat latency and uh, we are doing migration uh, measurements. The network IO latency that we are measuring uh, we are we tried to create a test case that is probably going to be useful for the telecommunications network. So we uh, we create a test case where we have a VM and it's running a DPDK application that does packet forwarding. So we measure what is the latency for a guest doing packet forwarding. For this test case, we are using OVS and DPDK in the host, and as I said, the application that does the forwarding is a DPDK application. And finally, there is uh, OpenStack support. Uh, I am not completely up to date to this, but uh, a lot of uh, features that we need on OpenStack are already merged, but there are some bits that are missing, and this has been, been uh, uh, worked out uh, right now. Uh, so that's it. I, I hope you enjoyed. I know it's a bit difficult talk, bit, bit difficult uh, topic, but that's it. You have questions? Oh, lots of questions. So we're going to need more scars. <laughs> Go ahead. It is wake up latency. We're measuring how long it takes when a thread, what second test does is this, uh, it, a thread set up a timer and it goes to sleep. When, it, when the timer fires, it wakes up. So it measures how long it took from being wake, waking up to actually running. And, and this is 11 microseconds. But you don't have the same result you know, yet, so it's uh, that, That's a very good question. It's uh, one microsecond, two microseconds, uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. I'm not. You know. I'm not <laughs> trying to. You know. <laughs> we we cannot expect that. At least not today. Maybe in the future. You know, with more features, etc. More CPU features. That this test case will perform the same. Actually, this is not even the goal. Our goal is not for. And and this is in interesting. Our our goal is not for the gas to perform the same as bare metal for. For now, because our goal is to uh, satisfy the latency requirements. So if the latency requirement is 20 microseconds, we are good. doesn't matter how, how, how better the, the host does, you know? So that's a good question and a good point. So you, you've got to start for yourself. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Uh, I don't know who raised first, but... Uh, so the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, I, I read about this, and for uh, very simple real-time systems, there was a professor in the U.S., I guess. He was advocating for trying to prove mathematically that, uh, you know, latency cannot be higher than an X value. But for a complex system like this, I'd say it's really impossible. And it, the, the testing that people do is they, they run the test case for three, four days, and, you know, if you don't reach a spike, they say, well, that's probably good. On the one hand, it's not mathematically proven, but on the other hand, most real-time applications, they don't have a very, very complex uh, the, the code path that they take. It's not extremely complex, usually. 
So usually you know more or less which code path that the application is going to take. And for cycle tests, we run it uh, millions and millions of times. It's a loop. And it's going to take the same code path. On the one hand, cycle tests are too simple. But on the other, uh, real-time applications, you kind of know the code path they are taking. And a test case usually is trash this code path. So you know, if you run this million, if not you know, hundreds of millions of times, and not, nothing bad happened, you assume that at a certain degree, it's not going to happen afterwards. You know. So you you got a scarf too. So, but you you can come here. Yeah, yeah. I don't know uh, how is the time. Okay, so we have time. Okay, I know this this guy there. I remember him. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, not for now. Uh, did we use this test case because cycle test, we use cycle test because it, it's kind of the easiest way to get it started. Uh, and in my opinion, you kind of have to, to do this first and you have to, go, uh, to have good cycle test numbers. Uh, but it, the, the uh, truth about cycle tests is that it's not real. <laughs> not what a real time application will be doing. So. The networking, the PDK and etc. stuff, we are doing this because the people who are going to use this now, it's what they, they need. So this is where, this is where we are uh, uh, working on because of this. Uh, now, one important thing about real time is that you know, real time is not like you install it and you can run any application real time. It's, it's really not about that. Real time is really specific about specific real-time applications. So uh, if there is the need, then we do it. But if there is not, then we, we don't do it. It's not, you know, I don't know if I am answering your question, but uh, we are focusing on the requirements we have now about hardware acceleration, for example. If it turns out to be to solve some of the problems we have, then it might be worth looking. But, you know, uh, Sometimes, because, I don't know if this is what was clear, but some, it could be a good idea, but sometimes real time is not about being fast, you know? It's about being deterministic. So uh, you could do something like this that is faster, and we improve the number, but it's not deterministic. We run it once, and we get one microsecond because it accelerated. We run it again, and we take 20. Not good, not good for real time. Yeah, so, well, I mean, like, not just for the, for the speed, but also for the, for the power. Okay. Like, say, some of you can use a whole, like, asymmetric vehicle. Okay. From the CPU and then from your, yeah. Okay. Okay, you, I guess. So, go ahead. So, when you hit the spot, how do you go about that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, we have more scarves. <laughs> uh, that's the hardest, hardest, hardest part. Uh, myself, what I'm doing is I have some tracing, trace points. I, I, I use F-trace, you know, the kernel tracer. Uh, I have some trace points that are a little bit optimized for cycle tests. So I know the code path that the cycle test takes. And when, I, when there is a spike, so instead of getting 11, I get 20. I look at my, my tracing, and it tells more or less where the spice occurred. So I have to add more trace points to start narrowing down the area. And then, eventually, I find it. And it already took three days, four days, to find a spike. And usually, it's a bug. It's, uh, for example, for ISO CPUs, we had a bug where 
You know, you, you isolated a, a CPU. But then the kernel was running code to see if it could migrate tasks to that CPU. But you, you don't need it. You isolated it. You are not going to run anything else there. So you're not supposed to be doing this. So this was fixed. And this degenerated a spike, a 10, 12 microseconds spike. Okay, go ahead. I uh, me. Oh, so we are testing on X86 for now. Uh, this is kind of new work. It's a more or less a little bit more than one year. But I have been talking to uh, an ARM guy, a guy who works with ARM, and the telcos are interested in ARM. So he, he told me that at some point, uh, real-time KVM and ARM are going to cross uh, uh, ways. Out of time, out of time, so you had a question. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you had a question? Yeah. When you have a problem with cache contention, when you have a problem with cache contention, 